talking about, and more importantly, how I present the information. Welcome to BIA Media, Canada's top black media provider. Whether you're looking for content on fashion, art, music, or simple lifestyle, we bring you the best the black community in Ottawa has to offer, and so much more. And better yet, do you have a project you need help with? Well, look no further. We provide equipment, studio, and office space, as well as a team of dedicated individuals to help you bring those ideas to life. So don't wait. Check out our new website at biamedia.ca for more information on how to contact us and start creating today. BIA Media. Your media, your way. All right, everyone. Good morning. Let's go ahead and get started. I am Dr. Clyde Ledbetter. Is it showing up on your end? Uh, for some reason, I'm still getting that. The, the video won't. There it is. There it is. <laughs> we're just coming back in the studio for the first time since uh, for a couple of weeks. So we're getting it back together. So welcome to week two of our course, What History Class Left Out, part one, African history from 10,000 BCE to 711 CE. Uh, if you were here last week, we talked about prehistoric Africa. We talked about the archaeological record. We talked about early human civilization, which developed for the first 200,000 years of our existence as a species exclusively on the continent of Africa. We talked about folks who practice hunting and fishing and gathering and kind of using uh, anthropological evidence, archaeological evidence to kind of reconstruct what those societies would have been like. We talked about uh, you know, folks developing agriculture and animal husbandry toward the end of, uh, uh, or around 10,000 BCE. We start to see human beings, first animal husbandry, so that's goats and uh, cattle and those things starting to be collected and domesticated. Then we move on to agriculture, which changes things in a lot of places. Some people, they continue to uh, use the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Um, to this day, there's people that still operate like that throughout the continent. Um, some people stuck with animal husbandry. And then other groups adopted agriculture, depending on their environmental circumstances. So that's kind of where we left off last week. And we also talked about the importance of African history and why we should study it. Uh, so we're going to continue along that vein today. And we're going to now get into the period of African history where history is actually recorded, where we can read written records from at least 5,000, 4,000 years ago, around this time period. And these written records are going to come to us from the Nile Valley. So we're going to be talking about, over the next two to three weeks, we're going to be talking about the Nile Valley civilizations of Nubia and Kemet or ancient Egypt. So that's what we're going to be getting into over the next two weeks. All right, so let's jump right into it. And if you missed last week's lecture, it will be up on our course website. You can see all of our lectures. You can read all the materials that are associated with these sessions, the journal articles, the book chapters, the videos uh, that uh, help explain what I'm talking about. Because this course is a the best way to describe it would be a superficial survey course. Superficial, not in that, you know, what I'm saying doesn't matter or is shallow, but in that we could spend an entire 15-week university course just on Old Kingdom, ancient Egypt, and still wouldn't learn everything. So the fact that we're dealing with African history from 10,000 uh, BCE to 711, you're not getting everything. There's so much to learn in each area, each region, and each people in Africa. So what we're doing is just a broad overview of some of the highlights of this history. So if you want to go deeper into a particular people, into a particular country, a particular time period, you can do that with your own individual research. You could always email me to ask, you, to ask me uh, where you can get started with that. But our course website is a great place to start because there's a lot of resources, a lot of readings that you can engage with previous lectures, videos, all to help you make sense of what we are discussing. So today, we're going to talk a lot about the Northern Nile Valley, the ancient civilization of Egypt, also called Kemet, K-M-T. There's no vowels in the ancient Egyptian language, so K-M-T, Kemet. Um, and we will talk about the importance of the Nile River. Uh, the Nile, uh, we'll talk about 
the development of ancient Egyptian civilization, why it's important to study it, and its connection to the rest of Africa. So uh, our objectives for today, our session objectives. At the end of this session, students will be able to understand the importance of the Nile Valley to African history. You'll be able to comprehend the evidence used in reconstructing ancient, reconstructing ancient Egyptian history. As we talked about last week, when we talk about history, when we make historical claims, we have to have the evidence to back up those claims, or else it's just elaborate fiction. <laughs> if there's no evidence, it's fiction. So uh, we always have to have our evidence. And we'll be able to recount key figures, events, and texts from ancient Egyptian history. Now, when we talk about ancient Egyptian history, and we start African history with, uh, here, we, well, we started it last week, um, it's important to point out a couple of things. Ancient Egyptian history is incredibly uh, rich and valuable resource, but we're not presenting it as if it is the most important thing in African history. It's not. We're, we have a lot to talk about because we have a lot of evidence. In other places in Africa, like we mentioned last week, we have a lot of archaeological evidence for this time period. So we're going to be talking about today roughly from uh, 4,000 BCE to probably around We'll probably stop today around 1500 BCE. And for most places in Africa, there's no writing. So we don't know what's actually going on among the people in a way that we can tell a narrative, that we can tell a story with. We have the archaeological evidence. So we can tell what people were what type of tools people were using. Uh, we can kind of get an idea of population sizes in certain regions in Africa. We have cave paintings that kind of depict uh, uh, what society was like and what animals were valued and those types of things. But they don't give us these immensely human stories that we get out of Nubia in Egypt. And much of what we know about Nubia, which is you know, modern day Sudan, we get from uh, the, actually the Egyptian perspective. But we'll talk about that uh, getting into next week. So uh, I want to start with this poem because it's really important to the time period that we're talking about, even though this was written in the 20th century, not back then. But this is Langston Hughes, Lincoln alumnus, Langston Hughes. He went to Lincoln University of Pennsylvania, where I happen to attend, so I always love to shout out Lincoln. But Langston Hughes was a great poet of the New Negro Movement, also called the Harlem Renaissance. And one of his most famous poems is The Negro Speaks of Rivers. He actually wrote this when he was young. Uh, he might have been just out of his teens when he wrote this. I think he wrote this on a trip to Mexico to visit his father. Uh, but anyway, Langston Hughes wrote this book. I've known uh, this poem. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood and human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans, and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. Now, this poem of Langston Hughes talked about these rivers. It's really important when we look at African history, because when we look at the great civilizations of ancient Africa, many of which that we'll talk about, uh, emerge around great rivers. Whether we're talking about the Nile River Valley, whether we're talking about uh, the River Niger in West Africa, whether we're talking about the Congo River, uh, or even uh, the Limpopo. These rivers have led to the development of great civilizations. Because they've allowed people to use the river as highways to facilitate trade. They've, of course, put fishing and, and so many other things. So, and in the Nile Valley, this is the lifeblood of the region. And we'll talk about the importance of the Nile. But rivers and, and lakes, we see the great lake kingdoms that emerge in, around uh, uh, Uganda and Rwanda, and even the ocean itself. So water is incredibly important in development of African history, world history in general. Many great civilizations develop alongside of water. So when Africa turned from this, a much greener place, when human beings first evolved in Africa 300,000 years ago, to looking more like it does today, Many of the folks that were up here that lived around Lake Megachad and some of these great lakes in the Sahara and these rivers that existed in the Sahara that are no longer there, uh, they moved into the Nile Valley civilizations of Egypt and of Nubia. Also, you had people migrating from this part of the world who had left Africa and then come back into Africa in the delta region of ancient Egypt. So Egypt has always been a 
territory at a crossroads of the world. And that's why it's so connected to world history. You got folks from what we now call the Middle East and the Levant that are in this part of the world. You have folks from Africa that are in the Nile Valley. So this region, incredibly important to world history, and we're going to get into all of that today. But the Nile Valley is the lifeblood of the entire region. It's what made Egypt great. It's what sustained Egypt. It's what still what is still sustaining Egypt to this day. Um, all right. So over the next two weeks, this is where we're going to be. We're going to talk about Kush, Nubia, Ethiopia. That's the, uh, three names for the same area. This part of northern Sudan was known as Kush. It was known as Nubia. It was known as Ethiopia. So don't confuse it with modern day Ethiopia. And we're going to talk about ancient Egypt. Egypt is a Greek name, Egyptos. Uh, the Egyptians themselves called their territory a couple of names. Uh, we have Kemet as a name for the territory. We also have uh, Tamari, T-A-M-O-R-Y, Tamari, uh, the beloved land. I think it's the beloved land. Uh, there's a couple of different uh, uh, definitions. But a number of names for this place, but that's what we're talking about. So I'll use them interchangeably. I'll say Kemet, I'll say Egypt. I probably won't say Tamari too much, but I'll probably say Kemet or Egypt, but I'm talking about the same place. If you want to follow along in the textbooks that I recommended last week, the early chapters of history of Africa by Kevin Shillington, I believe it's chapter three, and this book, Ancient and Civilizations of Africa, so the UNESCO uh, book volume two um, is where this information is if you want to follow along. All right, our evidence for what we're going to talk about today. We always have to start with our evidence. You want, I don't want you to think that I'm making this stuff up, and I want you to be able to uh, test anyone else's claims about ancient Egypt based off the evidence. We have a lot of the written record for ancient Egypt. They wrote on everything. They wrote on papyrus, which is paper. They wrote on the walls. We have their language everywhere, and it goes back 5,000 years. 5,000 years ago, they started writing, and we have all a, a, a great amount of that written material that we can reconstruct the history with. So that's good for us. Of course, archaeology. Egypt was one of the earliest places well, with our code, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Medu Necha. This is what the ancient Egyptians called their writing system, the Medu Necha. The Greeks called it hieroglyphics. But the ancient Egyptian name is, is Medu Necha. And again, there's no vowels in ancient Egyptian language. So we have to kind of be, uh, rely on the linguists to kind of tell us what the sounds were in terms of the vowel sounds. But Medu Necha is the best uh, we got <laughs> in terms of right now. Um, the archaeological record. Egypt is incredibly famous for its archaeology, and it goes to the climate. Since Egypt is mostly desert, with the exception of the Nile and a few oases here and there, things preserved incredibly well for the archaeological record, because it's dry. Things that are in dry places preserve well. We lost a lot of the archaeological record in this part of Africa because it's wet, it's rainforest. Things don't preserve well in those areas. Egypt was blessed in, 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 in a way because of its dry conditions. So things preserved, bodies preserved, and then when you add mum mummification to that, it, they were extra preserved, uh, buildings were preserved, you know, all of these goods and, and, and uh, items that we can rely on in the archeological record are preserved in ancient Egypt. Uh, so that's very important. The linguistic record. Uh, we can use linguistics to help recreate uh, ancient Egyptian history, and even the botanical record. We can look at the goods that were coming into Egypt from places like Nubia and other parts of Africa, and even from the Levant, and we can reconstruct how the people were engaged in trade based off the crops and the goods and the seeds and things that are left behind in the paleoarchaeological record. So we have a ton of evidence to recreate everything that we're going to talk about today, but a lot of it comes from number one and number two. We got the written record of what the Egyptians said about themselves, and then we got the archaeological record that fills in a lot of other things that weren't actually said in the written record, and actually take us back a lot further than what the ancient Egyptians were able to record themselves. So we have those things that we're going to rely on. Combining the two, the written record and the archaeological record, is probably one of the most important discoveries in ancient times. I mean, in modern times, to help us decipher what was going on in ancient times. In 1799, around the time that um, Napoleon has invaded Egypt, 
and he brought along with him a number of French scholars uh, to help him uh, basically rob <laughs> Egypt of its goods. This is something that we'll see repeated throughout the colonial invasion of Africa, the robbing of African cultural goods to fill European museums and then later on American museums, so on and so forth. But anyway, in a quarry, this was found, and they call it the Rosetta Stone. This stone had three languages written on it. Demotic, which is a later version of the Egyptian language, which was decipherable, Greek, and then the Metanecha, or the hieroglyphics. Now, for up until this point, from 17, uh, before 1799, Metanecha had become undecipherable for hundreds of years. No one could read it. It was all over the place. It was all on the walls in ancient Egypt. It was on papyri that people had access to, but no one could read it. With this, once they realized that the Greek and the Demotic said the same thing, then they realized that we can use these two to decipher this. After about 30 years, or, or about 23 years, it was deciphered. And it's really interesting the time period that this was deciphered, because once this was deciphered, we get a whole new view of Egyptian history that we didn't have before. But it's really interesting when this happens. This is happening in 1822. What also was happening in the world in 1822? Yes. Uh, basically, there was a bunch of unrest. Where? Were, I mean, not to say that, but like there were, like there was like the War of 1812. Right. Yeah, that happens around the time, and, and that's important to this story. Yeah, and um, I heard that uh, when it was deciphered, I heard that it was basically like a letter to someone thanking them. I'm pretty sure it was like a king of some sort. Yeah, probably. But most of our written sources are royalty or upper class folks writing about their experiences. But the interesting thing about this time period, this is during the era of enslavement of African people in the Caribbean, in the Americas, and even in Europe. So while this is happening, one of the justifications for slavery was, well, African people aren't even really people, and they are very close to animals, and they don't create history, they don't create culture, but this throws a monkey wrench into all of that. So now all new mental gymnastics had to be done. Because if this is found in Africa, and there's no denying that Egypt is in Africa, as we can see. Now we have to say, well, uh, we need to make all types of reasons to say that these people aren't the same type of Negroes or like the ones that we enslaved. So we get all types of mental gymnastics happening, and we'll get more into that a little bit later. But at the same time, you also had free black people in the Americas that were keeping track of this. And they had already knew, even before this was deciphered, that they could look at a map and see, well, Egypt is in Africa. So we're African people. Egypt must have some type of connection to us. And they began to use that and their appeals against slavery. One such was written by David Walker, one of the most radical free Africans at the time. He lived in Boston. And he writes this appeal to the colored people of the world in 1829, seven years after the Metanecha is deciphered. And David Walker is arguing for a violent overthrow of slavery. He's in the North, and he's trying to get the Africans in the South of the United States to violently overthrow slavery. And he writes this appeal, and he says, uh, some of my brethren do not know who Pharaoh and the Egyptians were. I know it to be a fact that some of them take the Egyptians to have been a gang of devils not knowing any better, and they, the Egyptians, having got possession of the Lord's people, treated them nearly as cruelly as Christian Americans do us at the present day. It's a very important sentence is what he's saying. He's saying a lot of black people know the Bible, but when they read about the Egyptians, they think that these are the worst people on earth. But guess what? The Egyptians treat the Jews uh, nearly as cruel as the Christian Americans treat us. This is, uh, this is the important sentence that he's saying. He's saying these people call themselves Christian, but they're treating us worse than the, uh, how the Egyptians are presented in the Bible. Uh, he says, for the information of such, I would only mention that the Egyptians were Africans or colored people, such as we are, some of them yellow and others dark, a mixture of Ethiopians and the natives of Egypt, about the same as you see the colored people of the United States at the present day. Now, this is 1829. 
David Walker didn't have advanced DNA uh, uh, analysis. David Walker wasn't using the most uh, efficient historical uh, uh, research methods. But he was correct. Very correct, actually. It's particularly when he talks about the physical manifestation of the Egyptian people. The same as you see colored people in the United States in the present day. Come in all shades and colors. You got people that look like Harry Belafonte. You got people that look like Sidney Poitier. For those of you that are uh, uh, of that age, you know who those two men are, two giants who just both uh, passed in the, in the past couple of years. And everything in between. So this is important because they're using this history that you can't deny of ancient Egypt. The pyramids are still up. The Sphinx is still up. You have all of this archaeological evidence, all of these paintings, all of this writing. And this shows the greatness of what African civilization could be. So to hold people in bondage, and one of the justifications is that they have no history, that they have no culture, that they're close to animals, it flies in the face of that. And that's what Walker is pointing out. So he's writing this to show African people that you have this example. You have this example. And this would, this would go on. People like Martin Delaney, he writes a book on uh, the origins of races and colors. The admission of the hieroglyphics, representations to be found on the temples and monuments of Egypt, of the advanced status of the Negro race, settles at once the controversy and leaves only to be proven the fact that the earliest settlers, builders of the pyramids, sculptors of the Sphinx, and the original god kings were blacks of the Negro race. And Delaney had actually visited Egypt and, and seen this. Uh, he saw the representations of Africans in Egypt and what they looked like. And he's writing this. Uh, Blyden, another early Pan-Africanist, uh, writes, uh, and he, another, he visited Egypt and Palestine, and he writes about this. Antonor Furman, the great uh, Haitian anthropologist, uh, argued for the Africanness of the ancient Egyptians. So you have all of these writers that are putting this African connection to Egypt that so many people tried to dispel, and continue to try to dispel, of trying to take Egypt out of Africa. If you take a class um, at, what did I look this up? That was at Carleton, no, that was University of Ottawa. You go in the history department, they have a class that says African history, uh, prehistory to colonialism. I think, or it might just be called African history, but they take all of African history and they put it in one course. They put it in one 15 week course. Then they have another course that says the Middle East and North Africa, as if North Africa is not a part of Africa. So it's very slick how these things are done um, to disconnect Egypt from Africa. Now, now, this is not to deny that Egypt has a relationship with the Levant and, and the Middle East. It does. But just as much as it has a relationship with Nubia and, and, and Canaan Bornu and, and these other areas, and Punt and these other places. So very important to, to point these things out. On the flip side of this, I do want to say this, that I think going through this process of trying to connect classical Egypt to Africa, I think many of us in, um, when I say us, I mean Africana scholars, have gone too much in the up. We have placed Egypt in a position higher than other African civilizations, which it doesn't deserve to be. We have more evidence for Egypt, but that doesn't mean that Egypt necessarily has to be this anchor civilization that we have to uh, attach everything in Africa to. I think some people have made that claim, and I'm not sure if we need to make that claim. And that goes from a very old uh, tradition in the academy of having these anchor civilizations. So when we look at Western civilization, the anchor civilizations are Greeks and Rome. So if you went to university back in the day in the early 20th century, the 1800s and into the early 20th century, even up to the mid 20th century, you learned the classics. You learned Greek. You learned Latin. That was considered the foundation of Western civilization. So many brothers and sisters that went through that education process, and of course it was an incredibly racist education process, they said, well, when we do African history, we should have an anchor civilization. And many of them said, let's anchor it in the Nile Valley. That'll be our anchor civilization. We don't have to follow the examples of the West and have these anchor civilizations. Every one of these civilizations in Africa that we're learning about, that we'll learn about over the next couple of weeks, they're all equal in that you had some 
advancements to human civilization, some technological advancements, some philosophical advancements, and you had some people that did some horrible things. They're, we're human. African people are just like every other people in the world. We're human. So we have our good, we have our bad. Egypt is no different. So I just want to put that out there as well. And I, I know I get some pushback from folks, but that's fine. I don't mind that. All right, so let's talk about Egypt. Uh, first thing to point out, when we look at Egypt, we view it this way. But the ancient Egyptians themselves viewed their world this way. Because the Nile River, unlike most rivers in the world, flows south to north as opposed to north to south. So for the ancient Egyptians, their world uh, manifested in their minds like this. So when we talk about Upper Egypt, we're talking about the south. And when we talk about Lower Egypt, we're talking about the north and the delta region that, that empties into the Mediterranean. That's really important to point out. Because when we talk about the kings from Upper Egypt, we're talking about the south. And when we talk about kings from Lower Egypt, we're talking about the north. So that's a very important uh, idea. So the Nile River, again, this is their lifeblood. This is what makes Egypt go. The reason being, Egypt is desert. But on the banks of the Nile River, this is where you get a fertile soil, an incredibly fertile soil that allows you to grow crops that can feed millions of people. Egypt became a breadbasket for the ancient world. So much grain, grain was the gold in Egypt. It allowed Egypt to export grain to the Mediterranean world and, and other areas. It made it incredibly uh, rich. We read about this even in the Hebrew text. They talk about there was a famine in, in, in Palestine and uh, Joseph and his brothers needed to, to migrate. Where did they go? They went to Egypt because that's the place that had the grains and they had the food. So very important, this Nile River, which the Egyptians called the Hapi. Probably not an A in that. It's, it's H-P-I. Yes? Um, the, the, the word Hapi, it's based on like their, their, their Egyptian god whose name is Hapi, and he was the god of the Nile. So. Yeah, exactly. And it's not just the Nile in and of itself. It's the Nile when it overflows is the god, because that's the important part. And the Egyptians realized this, and it's very early. This Nile River starts to influence so many of the advancements in ancient Egypt. One, they need to measure annually how much the Nile flooded, because this is what makes Egypt go, the annual flooding of the Nile River. The Nile River flowing up from uh, Ethiopia and, and coming through Sudan, when it floods, if it floods too much, it will wash out the crops and the things on the banks. It's catastrophe. If it doesn't flood enough, then not enough irrigation can happen and the crops die. So the ancient Egyptians wanted to flood just enough so that the crops could be sustained and people could live. So they developed something called a nilometer. A nilometer, it was a measuring system to measure the levels of the Nile River. So they could know, OK, uh, we might be in trouble this year. We might uh, we'll be fine this year. That allowed them to figure out, OK, what do we need to pack away? How much grain do we need to store? Uh, all of these things. In addition to that, as the population grew, because people were now being sustained by this agricultural production, land was scarce. You know, you only have a lot of uh, land on each side, of so many miles on each side of the Nile. And the rest is desert. So as you have a growing population, we need to divide up, well, who gets what land and how do we do that? So geometry is developed in ancient Egypt to survey land and to figure all this out. And as you have this growing population and these towns that are operating up and down uh, the Nile River, people need to develop a way of keeping track of these administrative happenings. You can't keep all of this stuff in your head. So this is where writing is developed as an administrative tool to keep track of this growing population and these uh, growing needs of this administration, these, uh, administration in these city-states, which we'll talk about in a second. But the Nile River also developed philosophical ideas for the ancient Egyptians. Like other communities around the world at this time, whether we're talking about uh, Mesopotamia or we're talking about China and these other rivers, river civilizations that are developing, the Indus Valley, when people are settled into agriculture and their life isn't so much geared toward what are, where's our next meal going to come from, you have time to think about things in a way that you didn't before. You have a time to look at the stars and try to figure out, well, how come I see certain stars this time of the year 
but not at this time of the year. Or what does this mean? And the sun comes up every day and it comes down and it seems to be a pattern to all this. So you have time to contemplate that. You have time to think about philosophy. You have time to come up with religious ideas. And if I do this, and maybe if we make this type of sacrifice, we'll make sure that the Nile River uh, floods the way it needs to flood. Or if I do this, it'll stop the animals from attacking my crops. Or what happens when we die? And all these questions that you now have time to think about and try to come up with answers to. So one of the first philosophies we get is this concept of ma'at. It's an ancient Egyptian concept. It stems from that balance we talked about. The Nile River needs to flood a certain amount uh, or else we're going to have catastrophe. We need balance. It can't, flood too, it can't flood too much or it can't flood not enough or we won't eat. Balance is key. And they took that from the natural world and then applied it to human interactions. How do we have balanced relationships with one another so we don't uh, exploit each other? How do we have order in society? We don't want chaos in society, which is the opposite of my, which is isfet. Isfet is chaos and disorder and warfare and famine and uh, bad interpersonal relationships. Or even within yourself, you want to be balanced. You don't want to have disorder or dis-ease, to be dis-at ease, the disease. So balance, ma'at, became one of the calling cards of ancient Egyptian civilization. It's a philosophy that stretches the entire length of the high period of ancient Egypt. So we're talking about 3000 BCE to the time of Cleopatra, which is about 30 uh, BCE. So about 3000 years. This is a key central philosophical tenet of ancient Egypt. If you were to ask an ancient Egyptian, well, could you describe your religion? They would say, just do my Live your life to do Ma'at. And we're going to see when we talk about the Middle Kingdom uh, how this image of Ma'at. Ma'at was often uh, depicted as a balance, a balance, a, a scale. Uh, and when you died, your heart was balanced on the scale of Ma'at. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, so important. All right, today we're going to talk about the Old Kingdom, and I'm going to take a break soon, uh, which stretches roughly from 2900 BCE to 2280 BCE. Uh, all right, just in terms of periodization, so you can kind of get a, a understanding of what we'll be talking about over the next two weeks. Historians break uh, the 3,000 year history of ancient Egypt. So I want to keep putting these numbers out because I want them to sink into your mind so you understand how long of a history that we have just for this civilization. 3,000 years of recorded history. The Archaic period from around 3200 BCE to 2900, the Old Kingdom, which we'll talk about today, the first intermediate period. So there's a, uh, a period of destabilization that happens called the intermediate period. Then the Middle Kingdom from uh, around 2000 BCE to 1785 BCE, another intermediate period. Then the New Kingdom, a lot of great pharaohs. We'll talk about that next week. Then the third intermediate period. Then there's a period of time where the Nubians, the folks from Sudan, take over Egypt, <laughs> the 25th dynasty from uh, 700 to 600. And then we get a number of other invasions. Uh, the Assyrians invade, the Persians invade, the Greeks invade, and then finally the Romans invade uh, in 30 BCE. So long period of time. A long, like, I, like I said, we can teach classes on each one of these eras and have whole 15-week courses just talking about these areas. This is just one area of, North, of Northeast Africa. In terms of world comparisons, and this is good to, to zoom out a little bit to see, the first dynasty in China emerges around the same time as, as the Old Kingdom. Uh, the Great Wall of China, though, isn't built until uh, around the 25th dynasty. Around 700 BCE is when the Great Wall starts. In India, the great sacred texts uh, of the Hindu, the, uh, the Vedas, aren't written until 1700 BCE. And Egypt is already in the second intermediate period when this is happening. And then the fountainhead of Western civilization, Greece, enters its archaic period, the earliest part of Greek history 900 BCE. Ancient Egypt is already almost 2,000 years old by the time that the Greeks start to show any advanced civilization. Uh, so just some things to keep in mind. 
All right. Uh, let me go a little bit faster. All right, so before Egypt was united as one Egypt, when people started to migrate to the Nile Valley, this part of Africa, they established themselves in 42 sapats. A sapat is a city-state. It's a city-state. Um, and did I have it as a, as a term here? Yeah, it's a city-state. Uh, the Greeks also called them nomes or, or, or gnomes. Uh, these are 42 towns that existed along the Nile River. They had their own gods. They probably spoke a language similar to each other. Um, but they were all independent city-states. Around 3000 BCE, the ones in the north start to get, I mean in the south, excuse me, see I'm messing up already, upper Egypt in the south, they start to get strong militarily. And a consolidation process begins to take place where different warlords say, hey, wait a minute, instead of just controlling this one city-state, maybe I can control all the city-states and bring them together. And that way I'll make myself richer, become a more powerful warlord and, and control. So we start to see the consolidation of Upper Egypt. The first ruler of the south of Upper Egypt that controls all of Upper Egypt, we actually have his name. This is King Scorpion. We know he's called King Scorpion because he has a scorpion next to his mouth. That's the image of his name. So it's King Scorpion. King Scorpion lived around 3100 BCE. And King Scorpion's came to fame as he conquered all of Upper Egypt. And we can see here that he has the crown of Upper Egypt on his head. So the consolidation, the unification of Egypt comes from the south to the north. Sometime later, he's followed by a man named Narmer. And Narmer is the first, also called Menace. Menace or Narmer, you see both names. Narmer actually means catfish. A lot of these early pharaohs have the names of animals as their names. So we, got, we go from scorpion to catfish. And you might think, why would a pharaoh want to name himself catfish? Well, if you've seen a Nile catfish, they're very ferocious animals. So he wanted to show that he's, he's a ferocious guy, and he's going to go up the Nile and take over st city state after city state. Andrew, but go ahead. Didn't Narmer, like, not only Upper Egypt, didn't he unite both kingdoms? Both kingdoms. Upper and Lower Egypt? Exactly. And we can tell that from the Narmer palette. Now, this was a ceremonial palette uh, created after his lifetime, but depicting this history. This is a, actually, historians say this is one of the first historical narratives, because it, it wasn't made during his lifetime. It was made afterwards to talk about what happened during his lifetime. And we see in this image Narmer subjugating people, and these are mostly people from the north, because uh, he takes over the Delta region, and he's wearing the crown of Upper Egypt in this image. And then on the flip side of the palette, you see him wearing the crown of Lower Egypt. This double crown is going to be one of the insignia of pharaohs of Egypt going forward for subsequent generations. It's a double crown, a crown of Lower Egypt and Upper Egypt. So you see, uh, you zoom in on this image, uh, you can see the crown of Lower Egypt. It's kind of blurry. Also in this image, and you can, tell, you can kind of get an understanding of how violent this conquering was. This wasn't a voluntary submission on the part of these city-states to say, OK, yeah, we'll, we'll just come together in a constitutional convention and create a united Egypt. No, it wasn't voluntary. This is a warlord. So what you see in this corner of the image are a bunch of people with their heads cut off between their legs. <laughs> so. And, and what you see in this image, you see the pharaoh depicted as, as, as a bull trampling his, his enemies. On this image, you see the, the and this will become a famous uh, 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 image to depict subsequent pharaohs showing their military strength, where they're uh, capturing a, 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 an opponent, and they're about to smite them with, with a mace. So you see, this is not a, a voluntary uh, 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 consolidation. This is the crown that pharaohs would wear. And this is also why Egypt was also referred to as the two lands often. The two lands. Throughout the history of Egypt, it was often called the two lands, Upper and Lower Egypt. And the pharaoh's job became, after this warlords established themselves as, as pharaohs, they, it also took on a spiritual aspect to it. It wasn't just a political position, it was also a spiritual position. Because it was the pharaoh's job to maintain harmony, to do ma'at, politically 
and economically. So as the uniter of the two lands, as the person that wears the double crown, it's your job to keep the peace between Upper and Lower Egypt. It's your job to make sure that the Nile floods the way it needs to flood. Even though, how can you say, how can we say a person is responsible for that? That's a natural thing. But no, this is the mentality. We're giving you this position. We are putting you in this palace. We are treating you and your family as almost demigods and, and, and semi-spirit and spiritual beings. So it's your job to make sure that you do what the gods ask you to do to make sure that the Nile floods the way it needs to flood. If not, we're going to have some problems. Andrew, go ahead. I think I can answer like, why they put the, the responsibility on them. So like, the Egyptians, like, they believed in a bunch of different gods, right? So uh, they believed that uh, pharaohs, they would channel on the power of the war god Horus. Yep. So basically, apparently Horus would give them the strength and the power to control all of that. That's it. That's it. What, what, if you're the hearing the voice, oh, sorry, let me introduce you. If you're hearing the voice, this is a, a young student that you'll hear from more uh, who's in the class who's doing the, the African history project that we talked about if you've been in previous classes. Uh, so Andrew's 14, about to be 15. So you're not hearing the voice of a university student. This is a student that's still in high school that's giving you this information. You're going to hear more from him and uh, his, 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 his partner, Abdallah, in upcoming weeks. But Andrew, you can always jump in when you want because he gave some good information. And one caveat with that, when we talk about religion in the ancient Egyptian world, it's really important because it connects with traditions throughout Africa. One of the commonalities we see in African tradition, traditional religions, there's always one high God, and then there's gods underneath or other spiritual entities underneath that God, all representatives of that single God. So in ancient Egypt, during various times, that single God would have different names. In this early period of ancient Egypt, that single god would be known as Atum, or sometimes Ra. Later on, it's going to be Amen, or Amen Ra, but that comes later on. We'll talk about it. Go ahead. Um, another thing about the crown is, like, to unite Upper and Lower Egypt, it actually had, like, two goddesses on it. So it was, like, Wajet and Mekbet, I, I, I believe. So yep. the, the cobra goddess and uh, the vulture goddess. Yep, so they representing were, the two they, lands. They were known as the two ladies. And they would like unite Egypt and give the pharaoh that power to keep the union. Very good. Exactly. Exactly. Well done. So when this happens, of course, they need a new capital. So the political capital becomes the city of Memphis. The city of Memphis becomes the political capital. You see where it's at. It's right at the, with the delta, because many of the city states in the delta were kind of here. And then you had the other city states. And it was. Uh, uh, 21 in the south, 21 in the north. All right, uh, this is another archaeological item associated with Narmer. This is called the Narmer Mesed, and it actually shows Narmer's marriage to a princess from the north named Nayeth Hotep, uh, and it depicts her, her marriage. Now, here's the interesting thing about Nayeth Hotep. She may have been the first woman on record to rule a nation. Because Narmer ends, his life ends rather unceremoniously. It's, it's written in the historical record. Uh, of, there's a record of the pharaohs compiled by a man named Manetho much, much, much later on, thousands of years after this history actually happens. Manetho records who's all, everything about the pharaohs of Egypt going back to Narmer. And he talks a little bit about their lives and what happened to them. Well, Narmer died in a tragic hippo accident. His boat was attacked by a hippopotamus, and he drowned, and he died. So when Narmer dies, his son possibly was too young to take over. So Nehethotep becomes the acting pharaoh until his son is old enough to take over. We think that she may have been the first woman to be pharaoh. And we don't know that to be true. She had another position as, as uh, just queen mother. But that's up in here. We'll talk about the woman that we know for sure is the earliest woman on in historical record to rule a nation. We'll talk about her in a second. And that is right here. We'll talk about her right now. That's Mirnith. Mirnith uh, is the great granddaughter of Narmer. And 
similar situation. Her husband died. Her son was too young to rule. But she actually rules as Pharaoh. And we know a lot about her because her son uh, writes about her. She had a, a temple, a, a tomb complex where they buried the kings of the old kingdom. She has her own tomb complex. And her name is written in a way that signifies that she is the Pharaoh or the Per'ah. Per'ah means great house. The Pharaohs were called Per'ahs, the great house. So she was Pharaoh. So we know that to be true. So the earliest woman on historical record, we don't know if there were other places in the world where women were ruling and what their names were. But if you want to look at the, if someone asks you, what's the name of the earliest woman to rule a nation that we have on record is Mirneth. And she ruled all the way back in 2900 BCE. 5,000 years ago, we have an African queen. Very important. It's very important because when we talk about these lessons from history, it's important that we recognize that. There's things that we can learn today. We look at the nations in Africa today, I think there might be two with a female head of state currently out of 54 countries. So what have we, what has become of our civilization where back then, 5,000 years ago, we said, yes, yeah, no problem for a sister to rule. We at least had one, possibly the second ruler of Egypt was a woman, possibly, after her husband died. But we know for sure, a few generations later, his great-granddaughter, Mirneth, was actually Pharaoh, and no one seemed to have a problem with it. And her son even made sure to tell people once he took the throne, I was prepared for this by my mother who was Pharaoh. Really important. Let me go a little bit faster because I know we'll run out of time. And again, like I said, we can teach a whole class just on the Old Kingdom. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, generations later, we get the building of the Step Pyramid in 2650 BCE. And this, at the time of its building, was the largest building in the world, the tallest building in the world um, by far. Uh, it wasn't even close for a long time. And it goes from the old mastabas, or the perjets, the houses of eternity, this is uh, uh, where pharaohs and, and folks who had some money would be buried. The tomb would be underneath the ground, and there would be this mastaba, which is an Arabic term for, for bench. But the, uh, the ancient Egyptians called it the perjets, and they would look like this. But then the pharaoh Joseph comes around. And I'll use the, the, this version of his name, Joseph. I'm not going to call him Netjeriket. Uh, I'll just go with Joseph. Uh, and his right-hand man, Imhotep. So you had the pharaoh. And you had Imhotep. So the pharaoh says, and this is, again, we go back to the blackness and the Africanness in ancient Egypt. This is how African people think. This is how African men think. This is what everybody else is doing? I'm trying to go bigger. I want to I go bigger. So he connects with his right-hand man, Imhotep. Imhotep was a multi-genius, one of the world's first multi-genius. He was a medical doctor. He was a mathematician. He was an architect. He was a statesman. He basically ran the government, or was a right-hand man in running the government with the pharaoh. And after his death, he was actually deified. He was actually spiritualized as a, a spirit of medicine and of healing because of his multi-talents. So Joseph says, Imhotep, I need you to build me a monument that will surpass everything else. So he says, don't worry, chief, I got you. We're going to take a mastaba, put it on top of a mastaba, put it on top of another mastaba and another one, and he builds it. He builds it. Now, this is a testament not only to Imhotep's genius as an architect, because it was freestanding and uh, you know, has not fallen down in <laughs> almost 5,000 years. It's still up. You can go to Saqqara in Egypt today, and you can see the Step Pyramid. It's up. But it also is a testament to the administrative abilities of Egypt during this time that you can marshal all the material forces and, uh, and, and the human forces, human resources, to create something like this. That would, create, make it be the top, that would have it being the tallest building in the world at the time of its construction. All this without, the, without a wheel. So people aren't even using wheelbarrows to transport these stones. They didn't have the wheel in ancient Egypt for a long time, not, not in the old kingdom. So all this is being done without the wheel. All of these materials being transported and cut to, to, to the way they need to be cut and, and placed, all of this. So think about that. I'm actually, uh, me and my father-in-law are redoing my backyard, and we're putting these bricks down. And it's just one layer. And we've been doing it for about three weeks, and I never want to do it again, <laughs> let alone how this was created. As you go uh, The mythological um, aspect of this, like, I, I, I know more about like, the myth 
uh, the mythological aspect of the step period, like the, the idea was, well, it's in the name, step pyramid, so that when the pharaoh died, he would, uh, he would ascend the steps into like the, the kingdom, like the underworld. Very good. And even earlier, these projects also have a spiritual aspect to them because what they're, re they're actually representations of the god Ptah. Now, Ptah is known as the builder god, the foundational god, and what he represents is when the Nile floods and that first land that you see, once the Nile floods and it recedes, that first mound of land that you see as the water goes away is the, the land that you can plant your crops on. So it was a beautiful sign when you started to see these mounds emerge as the, as the river recited and you knew that, okay, we're going to be all right for the next year. So Ptah was represented in these projects. So very, uh, yeah, there's always a spiritual aspect to a lot of this. All right, let me go for a little bit faster. All right, Met Jen. It wasn't just the pharaohs that were able to keep historical records. We also have these records of these noblemen who write about their lives. And Met Jen's narrative is one of the earliest representations of an everyday person. Now, he was a high official, but he was an everyday person. He wasn't royalty, writing about their life. And he, you know, it's, it's, it sounds mundane, but it's one of the earliest historical records of somebody saying, hey, I was here, and this is what I did in my life. And Met Jen writes, you know, uh, the property of his father, the judge and scribe uh, in Pumak was given to him without wheat and barley and the property of the estate but with dependents and herds of donkeys and pigs. Then he starts talking about his career. He was promoted to the first of the scribes of the office of provisioning and overseer of the office of provisioning. He was promoted to be the strong voice among those involved in agricultural productions. I guess he was a spokesperson for people that were, uh, no, that, that were farmers. When the boundary official of the sixth gnome of Lower Egypt was in charge of the judge and supervisors of the revisionary offerings of the sixth gnome of Lower Egypt, uh, who should take the job of judge and strong voice, so he was a judge. He was promoted to the overseer of all linen pr products of the king. And then he was promoted to be ruler of Pradesu and the towns which were under the same control, so he becomes like a governor. And then he was promoted to be the boundary official of the people of Butu and controller of the estate of Per Seduet and Per Sapa and boundary official. So this sounds like, okay, this is boring. Like, why are we learning about this? But it tells us so much. Look at the date. 2600 BCE, all of these officials, all of these uh, uh, jobs that they had, and everybody wasn't just a farmer. You had artisans, you had government officials. This sounds like Ottawa. This sounds like somebody in Ottawa's career. Yeah, I worked in this area of government, then I moved over to this area, then I got promoted to this area. So it's really important when we look back at the ancient times and see the type of administration that these folks created almost 5,000 years ago. Let me go a little bit faster. Fourth Pyramid. I mean, the fourth dynasty. These are the pyramid builders, the big pyramids that we talk about, the ones at Giza. And I like to talk about this as a testimony, a testament to African fathers and sons, because that's really what it is. Because these are a grandfather, a father, and a son building in the same area, showing their love for each other. I mean, just creating it. So we have the pharaoh Khufu, we have Khafre, and we have Minkari. These are the three pharaohs that build these <laughs> pyramids, which were the tallest buildings on earth up until the 19th century. That's how long they, they and to this day, no one is 100% sure how they were built. So we get all types of theories, oh, was aliens. Uh, and even before that, it was oh, white people came in and built them uh, and then left. Uh, so we have all of these, these things. But these were the, the builders. Who, who got, yeah. Like a fun fact. Mm -hmm. uh, the pyramids they actually used to they were they were a bit bigger yeah because like they had like a because people they took bricks over the years like you were saying before the white people came they stripped everything then they left uh, they used to have like a protective layer like a white coating and then a, a, a golden like thing on top they show that's like really cool because yeah like, they, they, this is worn down and it still looks super impressive. Yeah, you can imagine what it looked like. Yeah, they glistened. They glistened. And this was, again, 2500 BCE, around there where it's And And even the topography looked different because it wasn't as desert 
there was some greenery around this. They were close to the river. So you have all this. And there's, it's an entire complex. There's other smaller pyramids and other temples that were uh, in this region. So this is kind of the height. And this is the fourth dynasty. So this is another family that has taken over. Every time we go from another dynasty, that means a new family has taken over, whether through military conquest or through something. Uh, we have another strong dynasty in the fifth dynasty, but then things start to fall apart between 6 and 11. You have some environmental changes that happen. The Nile's not flooding regularly. The pharaohs start getting blamed. Uh, some, have some other catastrophes. Then you have political problems. Because remember, if we have two lands, Upper Egypt, Lower Egypt. You have all these city-states. You have all these government officials. And sometimes military officials or particular governors, they get big enough to say, I'm challenging central authority. I'm challenging the authority of Memphis, the authority of the pharaoh. And I think I would do a better job running the country. So you had all, a lot of civil wars happen. And this is called, between 6 and 10, the first intermediate period. It's called the intermediate period because there was no central order in Egypt. In fact, Egypt divides again into two nations. You have one with its capital at Waset in Upper Egypt, and then you have one with its capital at uh, Huet Nin Nesu in Lower Egypt. And you had families that were ruling a, a disunited Egypt. A lot of civil wars, a lot of problems happening until, uh, and I'll go past this, uh, you have this man that comes from the south, Menhotep II. Menhotep II comes from Waset. He comes from uh, what the uh, Greeks call Thebes. And he reconquers all of this and reunites Egypt. So oftentimes we see this. It's usually people from the south that come up to the north to reunite the country. Norma came from the south. Menhotep II came from the south. Later on, we'll talk about Akhmos I, uh, who comes from the south and drives out the Hyksos. We have these folks coming from the south. He reunites and uh, brings Egypt into the Middle Kingdom. Uh, I'll go past this. And this is another image of Menhotep II. Uh, and again, you all have eyes. You can see what this man looks like. We don't need to have these, these conversations. Look at him. How many people you know with lips like that? Come on. Like, we know what's going on. He, black, black is the ace of spades. And he has another one, a name, a Sunk Ib Tawi. He who makes the heart of the two lands to live, because he reunited Egypt and brought it into the era that we know as the Middle Kingdom. Um, because of this, because he comes from Waset, or Thebes, when he takes over, the main god changes. There's a religious movement as well. And the main god becomes Amen or Amen-Ra, who was a primary god in Thebes or in Waset, now becomes the god over the entire pantheon in ancient Egypt. And it's, he's associated with Amen, uh, with Ra, so sometimes he's called Amen-Ra, uh, but he becomes the hidden god. And a lot of the characteristics of Amen-Ra make their way into other religions. For instance, temples to Amen-Ra, you had a site called the Holy of Holies, where you had the priest of Amen-Ra, and the, and the regular people could be in one area, but then there was an area of the temple that only the priest could go in, and that's where Amen-Ra was you know, resided. We see that make its way into Judaism, where you had the temple in, in, in Jerusalem, where you had an area called the Holy of Holies that only the priest could go into. So we see this in, in other areas. But he becomes the main god at the beginning of the Middle Kingdom, and the priests associated with Amen-Ra become incredibly powerful too. And later on, we talk about the New Kingdom. There's a pharaoh that comes along that challenges this and, and upsets the entire apple cart. But we'll get to him. Yeah, we'll get to him next week. So hold off on that, yeah, because we'll get to him next week. Um, I just want to show some other images of Menhotep's family. Because here's one of his wives, King Ka uh, Queen Kawit, and his other wife, uh, Queen Kimset. So he had two wives, very similar names, doing very similar things, uh, drinking and getting their hair done uh, in these images. And again, you all have eyes. We don't need to be, 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 be labor the point. Look at this sister. Look at her hair. Look at her lips. Look at her drinking. It, it, it's African through and through. Um, all right. We'll stop there today because I've gone way over time and we didn't even do our first Q&A. But like I said, there's so much information that it's hard to stop and it's hard to, to bring in. And we didn't even cover everything. 
This is just, again, an overview. So please go into our course website, go into our, uh, uh, our readings, and, and you can uh, check these things out. Um, maybe I'll go for another 10 minutes after this Q&A, but let me uh, ask Daniel if you could let me know if there's anything in the chat or any hands. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, Daniel, anything in the chat? I couldn't hear you if you said anything. Um, no, there's nothing in the chat right now. Okay. Uh, David H., go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I was just curious about the, the written language, uh, Medir? Medunetra, yes. Medunetra. Okay, uh, so when we're filling in the vowels for that, is that right? Yeah, linguists have been able to kind of give us a um, approximation of what it sounded like using advanced okay. methods. That I, I'm not a linguist, so I, I don't know. But they, yeah, they have. Do, do we have any uh, books or resources about that on the? course website? Yes. Um, Explain how that's done. Um, I can put them there. I thought you meant in general, but I can put them on the on the course website. I can find them and put them there. We're going to talk about the language, um, if not today, early next week, because one important thing to point out, we're talking about 3,000 years of history. I'm going to point this out in a little bit. The language changes slightly for certain things. Some main concepts stay the same, like my, but some of the language changes, just like the English of today isn't the same English as 1600. You can read Shakespeare, but it takes you a little bit to get through it. It's the same thing with ancient Egyptian language. When we talk about the language, understand that even that is divided into eras, like old metanature, middle metanature, new kingdom metanature. It's, there's, there's differences even, even with that. And in all these uh, iterations of the language, there's no vowels. So when we say ma'at, that's actually just M-T? Yes, yes. But and so we're, we're yeah. filling in the vowels based on the evidence or information you're going to provide on the site. Right. And uh, I'll have to look for that because I don't have it right offhand, but I'll look for it. Um, but uh, yeah, and a lot of that has to do with the closest surviving language that we have to it is Coptic, the, the language of the Copts, Copt, C O. Uh, PT in Egypt um, and again this is a, like linguistic forensics they're able to use that modern language to kind of approximate what would have to fill in those gaps awesome thank you no um, and then follow up question which kind of segues from where, where I was the the you mentioned that at the time because of agriculture the society was able, because their basic physical needs for hunger were pretty much uh, satisfied, they were able to philosophize or create philosophy or do those type of things. Do you see any contrast or comparison with how people today are constantly being distracted or mm -hmm. in a constant striving to achieve or maintain so that they are unable to do the same type of thinking or critical thinking? That's a that's a great point. Um, never really thought I never thought about it like that, but that makes sense. You know, um, I don't know how, when when's the last time that folks have just stared up at the stars and contemplated. And then a lot of it is we think that we have answers to everything, um, and we don't. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, there's there's something to be said for that um, to just wonder. And, and, and to investigate in order to just investigate. We're doing some of that, but too much of it is tied to some type of material gain, even when we do do these investigations into things, like trying to figure out what's in the ocean or trying to figure out uh, uh, you know, what's on Mars and these types of things. A lot of that is being driven for economic reasons and not just for the curiosity of it. Um, so there's that, yeah, but the, the agricultural revolution, it did so much because it allowed people to engage in other activities to diversify what people were doing because the food production was taken care of. So, all right, well, I'll make artistry. 
or I'll become an architect or I'll do this because we have that. So a uh, very important transition in, in human development. Thank you for awesome. those. And, and last, last point. Good. <laughs> last thing. Um, the, we're, we're talking about the, the different types of cultures, different peoples, but last week we did solidify that all people originated from the African continent. Right. So therefore everyone is African and then it's just these different cultures that develops over time and then come back and decide that they don't like what they see on that particular <laughs> area or that particular continent. <laughs> but they're, they originally are African. It's not like we're, we're talking different races there because we know races don't exist. So right. these are different cultures that spread out, do their thing, and they say, oh, we don't like what's going on over there. And then let's, let's do something about it. Yes and no. Yes in that folks are African we're all African in that are, we all come from the continent. But when we put that term African on it, then there's also a modern African culture that's in a response to slavery and colonialism um, that I wouldn't count those people as African in that way, in this modern understanding of what we mean when we say African, because it goes to different things. African, yes, in that you like all human beings emerge from this continent called Africa, but African know in that if there was a very particular understanding of who is African that comes out of the more recent modern period, that's a political understanding, that's a, a cultural understanding that uh, I would not put everyone into that category. Does that make sense? So we were not talking from a genetic scientific evidence uh, perspective we're talking from the conceptual political uh, understand uh, yeah. yeah okay yeah. so we're, we're creating our own <laughs> our own division or lines to yeah. make this separate i just want to make that clear that it's not based in genetic no evidence no it's based in making this line political and moderate historical understandings of of Human relations it has nothing to do with genetics. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That. Perfect. Yes. Awesome. Genetically, there's no difference between really uh, somebody in South Africa and somebody in Norway. Um, I mean, right. besides the superficial things, uh, but humans are so underdeveloped in our interpersonal relationships that we create these 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 differences among us and and perpetuate harm and exploitation on each other as a result of that. Uh, so, yeah. All right. right. So uh, I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, and then, we, you know, so we move forward with that understanding. That's <laughs> Undergirding our understanding. Uh, I don't want to beat that horse again. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, that, that, that's good. It's good to reiterate that, though. Um, Thank you. All right. Let me go for about 10 more minutes, and then we'll, 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 we'll close up. Or Robert, did you have I did. Yeah. OK, go ahead. Uh, a comment and a couple of questions. Okay. Um, the comment is uh, that uh, that idea behind the myth that uh, white folks um, built the pyramids, we see uh, the idea behind that, that you know, white folks are the only, one, only ones can do all this great stuff. We see this in um, uh, post-apocalyptic uh, uh, white fantasy. Well, I've been watching a lot, a lot of this stuff like... Mm. Um, uh, Walking Dead, that guy, that all this, right? Because right? in all those things, what you see is the. Um, actually, well, first of all, you see this this post-racial world where, you know, uh, white folks and black folks are working together against a common enemy like the zombies. And, but the white folks are still leading, right? Because mm. right? the black folks somehow don't have any leadership skills or something. So that, that's where you see that kind of idea. Um, I used the, to think about that when I was a kid, um, with Hanna Barbera, is they had the Flintstones and the Jetsons. And there was no black people on either one. So what did I try to say? There's no black people in the past, and there won't be no black people in the well, future. Well, on that on that note, on that note, the um, in these um, well, in the, in, the, in in all this post-apocalyptic fantasy, there's there's a uh, um, do we see? As we know, we've uh, there's been uh, attempts at truth and reconciliation in uh, South Africa. 
right? They've tried to do it here in the indigenous folks. And we see that under those things, things have gone, change has gone slowly. I think what I suggest was really going to happen, and sorry, and, and, and in that, in these post apocalyptic fantasies, again, it's all like, uh, you know, white folks and, and black folks working together against a common enemy. I would suggest what's actually going to happen is that there's going to be a whole lot of truth and very little reconciliation happening. Mm. So, um, there's that. The a couple of questions. One is the pyramids were built like around 2500 BC. Is that yeah? Is yeah. Okay. And then this is this goes right to this issue of who built them. So, so then the everyone's you know people say oh no it was the Arabs that built that now, now the Arabs invaded around 600 CE is that correct is that right. around yeah right gotcha okay so just want to make that point yeah. um and the other question and you touched on this already but what um climate change and the effect on the the, the flooding of the Nile what has it done and what does it continue to how does it continue to affect them? so back then we're talking about again with a long civilization so you have cycles in in, in just the globe um well, we talked about this before so we're dealing with questions of, of rainfall and snow melt coming uh at the origins of the now down south so if those things don't happen right and that flooding doesn't go into the Nile River, which causes it to flood and overflow, you have problems. Uh, so there will be times cyclically where that wouldn't happen. Uh, lack of rainfall, certain things. And um, that would cause the political chaos. Because people will be looking at the Pharaoh like, hey, you know, it's your responsibility to look over this. We're giving you all this privilege and stuff, and you haven't done it. so." It was even some regicide in ancient Egypt. That's when you killed a pharaoh, some regicide. Um, but now, in, in today's time, you got a couple of factors that are influencing that. One, you have these dam projects that are being built along the Nile. And there's a lot of negotiation between, because this is affecting Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan. So there's a lot of negotiation between those three countries about where we're going to put these dams you know, what is it going to do to agriculture? What is it going to do for this, that, and the third? Um, so you have a lot of that in addition to the climate change, less rainfall, other uh, uh, weather patterns being disrupted, and so on and so forth. Um, there was a lot, a lot of considerations to that now. But now, again, still just as important today as it was back then. And even more so now, I mean, we're dealing with these three geopolitical entities in Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt um, that rely on it. All right, so let me move. Let me. I think uh, you know what? I'll I'll stop there today because uh, we'll go into this uh, next week. Yeah, we'll go into this next week. We'll talk about the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom uh, next week, uh, and we'll start with talking about the everyday people. Um, and the Middle Kingdom is really important because unlike the Old Kingdom, where the pyramids are built, we get the, the, these monuments that we're very familiar with, the Middle Kingdom, not a lot of building projects on a massive scale, but an incredible amount of literature. So we'll get into the literature of the Middle Kingdom next week. We'll talk about the New Kingdom and some of the great pharaohs because the Middle Kingdom is often the, the stepchild uh, in terms of history. People love talking about the Old Kingdom. And then the New Kingdom, we have these great pharaohs like Akhenaten and uh, Hatshepsut and uh, Ramses II. Yeah, and even the harem conspiracy with Ramses III. So there's a lot of great pharaohs and a lot of great stories in the New Kingdom. But the Middle Kingdom often gets forgotten. But there's a lot of great literature that comes out of this. So we'll start next class talking about the Middle Kingdom. We'll get into the New Kingdom. And then we will also talk about Egypt's interactions with its uh, sister nation, Nubia or Kush or Ethiopia. Um, and, and their reactions with, interactions with each other, which are incredibly important. Uh, so we'll stop there for today. We'll pick up there next week. Um, does anybody have any questions they didn't, didn't get to answer or comments that they would like to make before we uh, close out for the day? I know we're kind of off the general pattern because I didn't stop in the middle, but all right, I don't see anything. We'll stop there today. We'll pick up next week. Everybody, use the uh, course website if you can. Enjoy.